Yo guys, today we're gonna talk about the third episode of Justice For All, and if I didn't tell you this before, I'll tell you now. Justice For All is a very unique game in the series. It has what is considered the second best case in the series, and it has what is considered the worst case in the series. Today, we're talking about the worst. Turnabout Big Top. Remember when I said I loved cases 2 to 4 in Justice For All? I didn't say case 2 and 4, I didn't say case 2 4, I said case 2 2 4. So yes, that means I loved Turnabout Big Top. I even loved it more than Reunion and Turnabout. And hey, you know who else loves Turnabout Big Top? Well, the creator of Ace Attorney himself, Shu Takumi. Shu Takumi once said that Big Top was his first or second favorite case in the entire series. So hey, it's good to know that I wasn't alone. But does that opinion hold up? Well, let's go through it to find out. A lot of people hate the circus cast, but I think they're done quite well, and I'll explain why as we get to each of them. Max already has a lot going on from our first interaction with him. We see that he looks down on the other performers at the circus, and believes his flying act is superior. There's also a good dynamic going on between him, Maya, and Phoenix, where he's disrespectful to Phoenix, but likes Maya. Maya likes him because of his circus performances, and Phoenix thinks he's cringe, and all of this makes for some fun dialogue to start the case. Another interesting part about his character was that he didn't even realize he was arrested for murder. Well, it's not that he didn't know, he just didn't want to believe that it was true. From there, we see his Maximilian Galactic Persona break, and we meet Billy Bob Johns. He's from the country, and he joined the circus to pay off his dad's debt. Within 10 minutes, we already get a lot of characterization for a defendant. This investigation is just the epitome of fun. We get a tiger almost attacking us, and then we meet the second member of the circus, Regina Berry. What's interesting is, she's not sad about her dad's death at all. Then she also talks about her friend, Leon, who's a lion. Her dad killed Leon, but again, she doesn't seem mad or sad about it. It already adds some mystery to the murder and Regina's character. I mean, this girl is clearly acting weird. Your dad dies and you're just smiling. Then we got Ben who stutters a lot and is struggling to speak because he's shy. He doesn't like Max because Max clocked him on the head the morning before the murder. And finally we meet Mo. Mo is a funny guy, his jokes are not funny, but he laughs at them anyway and that's what makes him funny. Pair this up with the Maya and Phoenix and you have a lot of entertaining dialogue. Now let's talk about a part of the story that I and many others don't like. The Max Regina Ben love triangle. First, I don't like it from a writing standpoint. I just don't think it's that interesting apart from the conflict between Max and Ben in the cafeteria, but now this is where it can get really, really weird. Regina is 16, Max is 21, and he's trying to marry her. And then Ben is 31 and he attempted to propose to her. Yeah, that's just really weird. Now, I definitely think there's a cultural difference at play here. Turnabout Big Top is really popular in Japan, and from my understanding, Regina's age isn't seen as a problem there. I might be wrong about the last part, but that's what I heard. Despite the cultural difference, I still think it's weird. I mean, Regina acts so childish that it feels weird that all these guys want to marry her in the first place. I don't think this story was intended to be some tale about how older men take advantage of a sheltered girl. I mean, no one within the game brings attention to it, and even Phoenix has several moments where he's just lusting over Regina. And you know, I don't think Shu Takumi's trying to make our protagonist a hated character. So yeah, I think it's just a cultural thing and perhaps time plays a factor as well. Maybe this isn't acceptable in Japan now, but it was in 2002. I'm really not sure, but either way, it's a stain on the case because of how uncomfortable it is. Well, we find the puppet Trillo and all of a sudden we get a one-man comedy show. Ben and Trillo as a duo it's just really funny to me because it's technically just Ben. Whenever Trillo punches Ben in the face or yells at him, that's basically Ben punching or yelling at himself. I don't know why I find that funny, but I just do. Overall, I think the first investigation is excellent. It's very character focused. We learn about each individual character and the dynamic between the circus group. We establish which people witnessed the crime and now it's onto the trial. I do think the trial starts good. Obviously, I don't like the topic of discussion, that being Trilo's proposal to Regina, but it works for the case. Ben witnessed Max going to the lodging house, and that's why he's on the witness stand right now, and the gameplay in this part of the trial is good. There are weird parts, like presenting this broken bottle for why Trilo never said good evening to Max. The reason is that they got into a fight the same morning, 
which doesn't make it a conclusive contradiction. Thankfully, the game basically tells you to do this, so I don't think it's a bad or frustrating for that reason. If anything, the problem I have with it is the theory we form from the broken bottle. Phoenix says the person Trilo saw must have been the ringmaster dressed in Max's clothes, and it just feels like the conclusion was made because the game leads you that way. Like, if I was in court, I don't think I ever would have gotten to that conclusion because there are so many reasons as to why Trilo may have said good evening. He may have said it out of fear for Max doing something crazy again, or it just may have been a habit. Now something that's great about Turnabout Big Top is the pacing. In previous reviews, I may have critiqued segments that felt bland or investigation segments that may have felt dragged out. While in Turnabout Big Top, I honestly think the pacing is perfect. The first investigation sets up many plot points and develops on a few of them already. The investigation is also straightforward and easy to follow. Now what about the first trial? What's its purpose? It might seem like a waste of time because we end with the reveal that Mo saw Max fly away from the crime scene. Gumshoe already told us this during the investigation, so we're back to where we started. But within this time frame, we get a lot of important testimony that gives us a bigger picture of what might have happened. We learn that the victim was dressed up in Max's clothes, we learn that there was a hat on the person who flew, but also a hat on the ground, and we learn about the thump noise, which happens right before the culprit flies away. And of course we get the confirmation that no one walked away or to the scene of crime other than the ringmaster. The trial also has some great moments with Mo. I like how they use the three symbols and when Trilo brings them up, he gets the crowd to shout along with him. And then when Mo tries to do the same thing, no one shouts along. It's comedy gold. I also like that one testimony where nothing he says is relevant to the crime. Extra details such as this just improve the case even more. So overall, we have a phenomenal first day so let's move on to the second. The second investigation is also really good. We get to meet Acro, and every interaction with Acro is very interesting. He's so calm, which contrasts the rest of the circus performers, but you can always feel that sadness and anger present within him. We go through his backstory of him getting abandoned by his parents, we see his grudge against Regina, and we learn more about the accident with Bat. Again, the case is really good at giving its characters a lot of depth while adding more to the story. We get to see more of Max's frustration with the circus cast. He mainly hates the fact that they don't aim big. They aren't as ambitious as he wants them to be. Max wants the Berry Big Circus to be the best circus in the world, but no one seems to work as hard as him to achieve this goal. We also get to see more of how Regina is very sheltered. She believes that when people die, they just become a star in the heavens. In other words, she doesn't realize how tragic death really is and sees it as something good. This explains why she looks so relaxed and joyful, despite how tragic this situation really is. Honestly, there's no weak point here. The story with Leon and the dark side of Acro really adds a lot of suspense and mystery to the story. The only complaint I have about the segment is to do with the note Acro made. Planting the note in Regina's pocket is very contrived in my opinion. I mean, think about if Regina noticed him doing that. That would be really awkward, wouldn't it? Overall, it's still another great segment, and now it's on to the final day of the case. The case doesn't really stop in terms of developing its characters. Regina doesn't really understand what's going on, so Mo decided to bring her to the courtroom so she could face reality. Mo really is on the top of his game. He even realizes that Acro is the killer, and he's ready to face the truth. We get to see Mo showing his mature side a lot more. This was built up in the second day of the investigation, as he used less of his clown jokes and became a lot more serious, and it's good to see that this is carrying over to the final segment. Now let's look at the trial. I think the first contradiction is fine. Acro says he saw Max flying with his hat on, and you have to present the hat because it was left at the crime scene. Then we present Max's bust as the weapon Acro used to commit the murder. This explains how Mo saw a hat, even if there was a hat left at the scene of the crime, and explains why there's no footprints. Francisca's rebuttal is a fair one. The bust should be really heavy for someone who's in a wheelchair, and this leads to a testimony about Acro's physical ability. Acro confesses he can lift the bust in the trial, and says the impossible part is lifting the bust and looking out the window. We then prove that Acro could know the ringmaster's location without looking through the window using the box. Now the mystery up till this point has been fine, but this is where we start to run into some problems. Phoenix describes the box being used as a mark for the bust. When the victim picks up the box, Acro will release the bust and the crime is committed. But how does Acro know when the victim will pick up the box? 
Is he just using the time written on the note and releasing the bust at that specific time? If that's the case, then the crime is really bad because it relies heavily on chance. And I've heard other explanations for this. I've heard the explanation of Akro hearing the person's footsteps, but even that's just an assumption. I mean, he's on the third floor. How are we supposed to know if he can hear someone's footsteps? This is easily the biggest problem with the case. Turnabout Big Top's murder method will always be in my head. It's going to be impossible for me to forget how it was done. But I know for a fact that if I had never played Ace Attorney and tried to solve Turnabout Big Top today, this would be my sticking point. How does he time the release of the bust? And as far as I'm concerned, there's no good answer. It's easily the worst part of the case, and yes, I haven't forgotten about the cloak bust trick. At least they explain how the box's size and weight will make someone's head end up at approximately the same place. That's a very good detail. The accusation of money stealing the bust is also fine. Although it does seem insane that money could lift the bust, it is subtly hinted at that money can lift heavy things since we see a tuba as part of his collection. For the purpose of the case and confusion of players, I don't think this need to be very subtle. Phoenix just says money is a strong monkey and Acro agrees to the fact that money can carry the bust. Now here's a contradiction I really don't like. We talk about why the cloak is on the bust and Phoenix has to tell the court who placed the cloak on the bust. For some reason, the correct answer to this question is Russell Berry. The problem is, Russell Berry didn't place the cloak on the bust. The game even says placing the cloak isn't the right way to put it because he literally gets hit and the cloak snags onto the bust itself. So why is Russell Berry the correct answer? Instead, the correct answer should be Acro. Acro placed the cloak on the bust because he was the one who used the bust as a weapon. It was his action that made the cloak snag onto the bust. So why is presenting Acro the wrong option? If anything, make both Russell and Acro correct because the way the crime took place doesn't allow for a clear answer of the question. After this question, Phoenix gives the court his theory and we get to see the infamous moment. We see the cloak snagging onto the bust. This moment is not that good. I'll play devil's advocate, I'll explain why I don't hate this moment as much as a lot of other people, but I'll also explain why I still don't think the moment is that good. The game implies that the creation of Max on the scene was an accident. Akro never meant to frame Max for the crime. This is implied when we say that anything could have been the murder weapon and it just happened to be the bust. And even Phoenix thinks of it as an accident when he explains it to the court. He says that Akro had no idea he was pulling up the bust with the cloak on. It was never a part of Akro's plan, so I'm fine with it. People do also question the physics of the cloak getting snagged onto the bust, and while I do admit it looks weird, I don't think it's horrible. I can see what the game was going for and I don't think the physics is super crazy. It's not like the cape jumped 20 meters to snag onto the bust. If anything, the way it was shown might make people find it more unbelievable than it is. You don't get to see the cloak bust trick happening all at once. First you see the bust fall down, and then you see the cloak moving on its own. You don't see both parts happening at the same time in one smooth motion, and I think that makes the trick a lot less convincing. I don't know why they didn't show the trick happening all at once, it could be the rush development cycle, or it could be technological limitations, so I don't want to make any judgments on that. If anything, I will say I think there are crazier physics tricks in this series, and I really don't think it's as bad as everyone makes it out to be. However, it's very easy to see why the majority are left very unimpressed with the trick. I've said it once before and I'll say it again, I'm no physics genius. I have no idea whether the cloak bus trick is actually possible or not. However, the very fact that it seems like it could be impossible is the reason why the trick is not satisfying. When I see this cloak gliding onto the bust, I'm not thinking, oh my god, what a genius twist. No, my reaction is more like, uh, oh, oh, I guess that can happen. It's something so uncertain that you'll probably never think about it when you're trying to solve the case for yourself. And even if you do think about it, you might dismiss it because you're unsure if the writers would think that's logical. I mean, one look at Franziska describes the moment perfectly. She's so surprised that she doesn't even have a counter argument. Phoenix just told her a crazy story, and now she has to find a way to destroy it. And even though what Phoenix is saying is circumstantial, the judge is fine with going along with it and seeing where it leads. I like this a lot. The case isn't over because Phoenix hasn't proven his theory to be true, but if we keep going, we might get to the truth eventually. And so we bring up the motive. I already went through my problems with the motive in Reunion and Turnabout, 
so I'll only briefly touch on it here. It's never been clear what the motive does for a case. In turn about Samurai and Reunion a turnabout, we got to a point where we poked a hole in the witness's testimony, and they did not defend it. And then we had to explain their motive in the end, and both witnesses ended up confessing. What would happen if they didn't confess? Would the case go on, or would those conditions be enough to say that those witnesses are guilty? It's very unclear, and that's my problem with the motive being a talking point. I also question why Bat didn't sneeze before Leon. Like, this guy was wearing the scarf before he went to Leon, and he just didn't sneeze, I guess? Maybe just a really stuffed nose? Uh, I think they could have done a better job explaining this, since Phoenix says Regina covered the scarf with as much pepper as possible. In any case, I can't even tell if Akro confessed to the motive. He comments on how Orite's the only one who treated the issue with the lion seriously, but at the same time, he doesn't directly admit to the motive either. Instead, he brings up the murder again, which brings up the question of what the point of the motive is in the first place. But hey, I'll at least say the motive section for Turnabout Big Top was a lot better than the one in Reunion and Turnabout. It's way shorter, so it's not much of a distraction to solving the crime, and it has a lot less wrong with it, so it honestly isn't that bad. Acro asks Phoenix to prove that he hit the ringmaster using the bust, and that is an excellent point. We don't even know where the murder weapon is, and we don't know if it has traces of the victim's blood. So even though the bust can explain a lot of contradictions, we can't conclusively say it's the murder weapon. Acro's room was searched, and it wasn't anywhere else at the circus either. So where could he have hit the bust? Well, the answer is that it's in Acro's wheelchair. It's supposed to be a process of elimination deduction, but I still wish the game told us that his blanket covers his wheelchair beforehand. It would make the deduction a lot more clean, and it would feel more satisfying to get it correct if the game hinted at it before. I will say this is at least a very good way to catch the culprit. The murder weapon being on Acro lines up with Phoenix's theory, and more importantly, it will prove that Acro used the bust to kill Russell Berry. It's time to talk about the post-trial, and with that, we have to talk more about the characters. Again, I love the characters. I already said everything I wanted to about Max and Ben, so let's talk more about Regina, Mo, and Acro. Regina's light take on death is a very interesting concept for a character, and it's implemented very nicely. She lives a very sheltered life, so she doesn't know too much about the world outside the circus, kind of like how Pearl doesn't know too much of the world outside Corrine. She pulls a prank that she thought would be funny, and ends up sending Bat to a coma, and Acro loses his legs. And even after this happens, she just laughs it off. We then have Akro's perspective. It's very easy to see why he was motivated to kill Regina. His brother is asleep, and Akro can no longer perform as an acrobat. His movement has been restricted, and a large portion of his life has been taken away from him. To top it all off, the person who caused this accident just laughs it off. He meets this person every morning, and they just smile and show no remorse for what they did. It's not hard to see how all this built up anger led to the crime. To top it all off, he killed the person who raised him. Acro was abandoned as a 9 year old because his parents had financial issues and the ringmaster was nice enough to take care of him and his brother. And now, Acro kills that same person. We even get to hear about how he went insane after the ringmaster's death and only calmed down the day after. Yet the most calm person in the circus might just be the most immature one out of them all. As many people say, he could have just talked to Regina. He could have just told her that people who die never come back, and he could have told her to not take the incident lightly. But he didn't. Because although it seemed he was the most mature member of the cast, he really isn't. His anger took over, and he never even wanted to talk to Regina about the incident. He just lived those 6 months with hatred, and he finally snapped. I think there's a piece of evidence that implies this. The evidence I'm talking about is the note Akro wrote to Regina. This note was the main reason that his plan failed. If he just wrote, to Regina, instead of writing, to the murderer, he would have summoned Regina to the location of the box instead of Russell. If you think about this from the perspective of a logical murder plan, it's really dumb. Akro should know more than anyone that Regina wouldn't consider herself to be a killer. After all, she took the incident very lightly and didn't seem to think much of it. But Akro isn't logical. Akro makes a lot of his decisions with his emotions. Even when he writes his note, he avoids Regina. Instead of directly confronting her about an issue and writing her name on the note, he just writes, to the killer. Even in his interactions with Phoenix, I can really see Akro's avoidant personality. He occasionally brings Regina up, and it's clear that he doesn't like her. But yet, 
he can never fully express his feelings about her. Whenever he talks about Regina, he still does it in a calm manner, and I feel like we don't get to see his true hatred for Regina from words alone. Acro is honestly a really well written character. He's probably my favorite killer so far. I suppose a part of why I think Acro is well written is because I can relate to him on a smaller scale. I feel like I've had similar problems where I didn't like what someone was doing, but I never talked to them about it and just hated them from a distance. I can't really explain why I acted like that, but I suppose that's why I can understand where Acro is coming from. But we also have to talk about the clown, Lawrence Curls. Mo contrasts Acro by initially seeming immature, but by the end, he might be the most mature person in the circus group. In Trial 1, the game paints Mo as a very immature person. He isn't very cooperative and focuses more on trying to get people to laugh rather than testify. He gets mad when people don't like him and acts like a spoiled child. And he still has that side to his character. However, we also get to see his mature side. He doesn't like people to sulk over the ringmaster's death, so he tells people that they have no time to cry and to stay positive. However, he also brings Regina to the courtroom to show her that the death of people can have a huge impact and it's not meant to be taken lightly. Regina has a breakdown and understands where she went wrong. The other reason Mo brought Regina to court is to show that the circus group all have to work together. The members of the Berry Big Circus had a lot of fighting within their group, but if they want to fix the circus, they have to prevent all conflicts and start working together. With this, Mo brings the circus group back together and the members of the Berry Big Circus have a mission to be the best circus the world has ever seen. It's an excellent story. Now I do want to bring up something from my first experience with this case. Despite not remembering a lot about the games, I do remember struggling a lot with this case. It was an insane spike in difficulty and I just remember getting game over after game over. What's funny is I remember going to Feral my turnabout and that felt like child's play compared to this. Remember the new penalty bar system? Well, this is where it starts to do some insane things. I never mentioned this yet, but Turnabout Big Top is the first case where you can get penalized for pressing. At least I think it is, I'm not too sure, but I don't recall that ever happening in the first game. Not only that, some of the penalties are insane and can deplete up to half of your health. And you do have some unfair contradictions, such as the one I brought up in this video. But yeah, overall this case might be the hardest in the series, and that can make it frustrating to play. I was fine for this playthrough because I remembered some parts of the case already, but I can see how this case might be worse on the first playthrough, so I will factor that into the review. I think the biggest problem with Turnabout Big Top are certain aspects of the crime. The biggest culprit is the timing of the bust, which takes off a lot of points for the case. There are a few minor problems, again Acro being able to slip the note into Regina's pocket is very convenient, and his plan was to kill Regina, right? So what if she never decided to open the box? I think he probably should have written that detail in the note because it seems very plausible that Regina would just not open the box and wait for someone to arrive at the area. Another weird detail is the fact that Acro summoned Regina at 10pm. This is a huge detail because Mo was a witness to the crime, Mo was still awake in his bed since it was just about time for him to go to sleep. So let's consider what would happen if Acro summoned Regina later at night and Mo was asleep. It's possible Mo would have waken up from the thump noise and still witness the bus flying, but making the murder happen at a later time would reduce Acro's chances of getting caught as he would be in a deep sleep. So why did Acro choose 10pm as the meeting time? Did Regina have a strict bedtime she followed? Perhaps Mo usually goes to bed earlier? Or did Acro not care if he got caught? Acro did say he was planning on turning himself in at the end of the trial, but it's unclear if that was his plan because he killed the wrong person, or if that was his plan regardless of who died. I think a lot of these case details are what hold the case back from being one of the best in the series. Overall, I give Turnabout Big Top an 8 out of 10, and I do maintain my position of this being better than Reunion and Turnabout. It definitely has bigger problems, but I think its cast and story are phenomenal. I think the pacing of the case also helps, each segment of the case is fun, while in Reunion and Turnabout, I really love the first half, while I find the second half to be quite boring, so in that sense, Turnabout Big Top has more consistency. I'm truly surprised that this is considered to be one of the worst cases in the series, because I think it's one of the better ones. And with that, we only have one case remaining. This is the case that I believe to be the best in the entire series. Will that opinion hold? Well, we'll see if that's true next time as we review the final case of Justice for All, so farewell.